Well, good evening, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Thumbs up. I'm Michonne Boston, and um, welcome to this virtual salon. If under different circumstances, we'd all be together in person. But there's some, there's some advantages to having these virtual gatherings because you can bring people in from all over the world, um, even within your own city. And you know, there's no, nothing to clean up afterwards. So <laughs> after you get together socially, so welcome. Um, I'm Michonne Boston. For those of you who don't know me, I have a consulting company called the Michonne Boston Group. And I work with some very wonderful, wonderful people on a lot of media projects and storytelling projects to make a difference in this world. And I'm always happy to share those experiences with other people. And hopefully, hopefully the purpose of these, um, these meetings is to foster some collaboration, encourage collaboration, introduce people to one another and then see where things go from there. I've seen different kinds of projects bubble up as a, as a matter of um, introductions and connections between people. And I hope that I can accomplish that or we can all accomplish that this um, evening. So um, let me just start with a couple of things that are going on. Um, I'm going to launch a poll and um, you're going to, you should see that in your, in the chat or in the window, just to tell us about yourself. And while you're doing that, I want to um, I want to read something that I've been reading actually since um, it was my reading during the election uh, on November third. Uh, just in case I wasn't able to get any sleep, I decided you know I'll read a book rather than watch the television. And the book I chose was The Purpose of Power how we come together when we fall apart, a memoir by Alicia Garza, who is the co-creator of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter Global Network. And she writes, um, movements are composed of individuals, organizations, and institutions. Movements bring people together to change laws and to change culture. Successful movements know how to use the tools of media and culture to communicate what they are for and to help paint a picture of what an alternative world can look like, feel like, be like. So I want to tell you what the inspiration is for this, this virtual salon. Um, it was inspired by the DC 1968 project, which is curated by Maria McWhorter, who's joining us this evening. And that project was launched in 2018 for the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and the uprisings in major US cities in response. Over the summer during lockdown, uh, I worked with Maria to prepare the site for archiving in the DC Public Library. So that will be going up on their website um, pretty soon. And reviewing those daily posts, all 365, I noticed the pattern. Um, movement, what does movement mean? It's, it's people from all walks of life. There were students doing things, day workers, teachers, artists, activists. It wasn't all marches, it wasn't all boycotts, and it all, wasn't all demonstrations. It was all that in combination. It was also getting through the day. It was going to a job. It was getting a job. It was going to school. It was staying in school. It was journaling about what's happening in, in the 14 year old's life as all this is unfolding. And that's my sister and I think she's in this room too. Um, and I just wanna make a note. I never, never ever read her diary until it was published on the DC 1968 project website. So just wanna go on the record. Um, but I wouldn't have read it or I wouldn't have known any of this information if not for digital technology. And if someone hadn't taken that initiative like Maria to put the movement into this kind of context, it would have just been a grab here, the grab there, or we go to the usual places, which is, you know, we see the demonstrations, we see the marches, but we don't, sometimes we, we don't get to see the real work, that work that funnels that and, and supports that. And that's why I emailed Jennifer Lawson, who was putting together the SNCC story for the SNCC Digital Gateway. And also Thomas Allen Harris, who's putting a special emphasis on the role of photography in telling stories 
that reveal who we really are with some interesting surprises in people's lives. And also Edward White, who was in our first salon, because this is the second virtual salon, and we host, I did one on Kentucky this summer, and he's, fought, he's transitioned to his role, from his role as founding director and, and um, leader of the River City Drum Corps in Louisville, Kentucky, and now returning to his passion of art and photography. So, you know, I'm happy to encourage that, absolutely. Um, and he's been documenting what's been going on in Louisville, Kentucky around the justice for Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. We, as I said, we have a few polls and exploring questions that will go into the checks. So look out for that during this um, event. Um, we're going to have each presenter do a show and tell, show, show the work. Um, also, we'll talk about what's, what we are seeing, our salon group just amongst ourselves today and how their projects connect and even mirror what's going on with movements today in the present day. Finally, we'll take your questions for the panel and um, you can use the Q&A box, but I'm gonna try to pay attention to that and the chat just in case, you know, some people don't get to the Q&A box on Zoom. Um, and also just a reminder, today's event is being recorded just for the record. It is not being live streamed on Facebook or Zoom or, or YouTube. So I also want to let you know my second person here is Rashid Willis, who's been working with me behind the scenes for these events. And we hope to have a good flow for this conversation. So let us begin. So I'm going to close the first poll and I'll share the results, everyone. And now let's, let's begin with Jennifer Lawson. Jennifer, you can unmute now. Jennifer Lawson has been the Chief Programming Executive for Public Media, that's PBS and CPB, a filmmaker and an active member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC. Um, you can read about her background during the time on the SNCC Digital Gateway website, and she's gonna give us a tour of that website right now. So Jennifer, I'm going to turn this over to you to tell us um, about the website, how it happened, and what's going on with it today. I know this was a heavy lift for you <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Michonne. And it's my honor to be here and to join Maria and Edward and Thomas Allen Harris for this uh, session. Of, of, and of course, especially to be here with Michonne. And um, the SNCC Digital Gateway, I'd like to give you a, a brief tour of the SNCC Digital Gateway. But to start that, I'd like to tell you just very briefly about SNCC. And for those who may not know, SNCC really stands for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And it was a civil rights organization that began in 1960 with sit-in demonstrations at that time from mostly HBCUs like uh, Fisk University, Tennessee State, uh, many other colleges, particularly throughout the South, uh, students from Howard University and other places. And that Ella Baker, thought uh, she was working at that time with the NAACP and she thought that it would be a great thing for the students to talk with each other. They were having demonstrations, marches in different places, sit-ins, and she thought it would be really great to bring them together. And she did. She brought the students together for a meeting at Shaw University, the historically black college in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And that when the students met there, that became, they formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and nonviolent because they, after talking about it and everything, they felt that is the right strategy to pursue at that point. And it clicked and the, uh, SNCC then went on to do a number of other things. I'm going to start sharing my screen here so that you'll be able to see what we've been doing. I assume you can see this. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so we then, a group of us from SNCC 
a SNCC uh, really sort of ended around 1968. Um, and sure, that Maria can talk about the year 1968, but that the organization, we had so much momentum, so much energy, and that we all cared so deeply about each other that we continued to have meetings and that we had a 50th anniversary meeting at Shaw University in Raleigh and that in 2010, and that when we had that meeting, we were astonished to find out how many young activists, how many scholars were there to learn about our work. And we thought, gee, we owe it to them. We owe it to the future to make a repository to create some place where this information can be readily accessible. And that became the SNCC Digital Gateway. We, because we were in North Carolina, we started talking with Shaw University and with several other colleges there. And Duke University came forth and said, we'd love to have you do this as a part and in collaboration with us in the Rubenstein Library and with the John Hope Franklin Center there. And there were terrific people working there. And after we talked it over, it seemed to be a perfect fit. And so as a consequence, we have been working then hand in hand with Duke University to create this. This website contains a history of the organization SNCC. But it does more than gives than providing that history. It also has sections in it with young people, people like Alicia Garza, who Michonne mentioned at the top of the program. So we have, in part, our meetings have been with young activists and getting their, hearing their questions, hearing them talk about their challenges. And that we've also tried to encourage them to uh, put their stories to start now archiving their own stories. We do profiles each, there's a section on people and their profiles of some of the courageous men and women who were a part of SNCC. This is one who Ruby Doris Smith, who started as a Spelman college student and went on to become the executive secretary of SNCC. We also give a history <clears throat> of the activities that we carried out. Excuse me. So we talk about <clears throat> what we did. <clears throat> More water. We talk about what we did, where we were, and what our strategies were. And then we went back and interviewed some of the people who worked with us so that we have then information about them online in this way. I'll just end here with uh, just giving you a sense of some of the kinds of setting, of sessions that we have documented here. This, for example, is a session that was where we were talking about how hey, we organized. Go to jail. Have you ever prepared yourself to go to jail? We even prepared ourselves to die for all mankind. And to get hyped up in the basement of First Baptist Church, they were hollering. I'm sure you heard it many, many times. What you want? You haven't heard it. Freedom. We used to scream 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old students from R.B. Hudson High School. And we'll scream out, what you want? We Let me call, thank you. They don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're still looking for freedom. What you want? Freedom. Yeah. What you want? Freedom. And when you want it? Yeah. Whoa, this is out of mind, baby. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the, the spirit of the sessions that we have been able to record and that we have been working on this now for seven years and have collected an incredible amount of things. We have asked activists to please donate their materials to the site. And we've gotten a, a great outpouring of material. So uh, many people have their papers there at the Franklin Institute. And that it has been, we've insisted that there would be access, open access, because sadly there are some archives where people are being written out of history practically because they have placed so such stringent restrictions on accessing their papers, their documents. And so, if, you know, when you get to a point where you can't quote, have in a film, a quote from a particular leader or something because the family wants, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, then you end up with that person being left out of the accurate telling of their story, which is quite sad. So we've tried to avoid that by ensuring that the materials that are here are fully accessible. So that's the SNCC Digital Gateway. It has profiles of people. There's Stokely Carmichael, there's uh, Kwame Ture, who then we talk about black power. We talk, you could go through the site and see an evolution of our thinking. And that same kind of evolution of thinking goes, extends on to you being able to see what some of the thinking is of young activists of today. And that's one of the parts that's exci most exciting to us, the way in which it incorporates then the thinking and the activities of the young activists today. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm almost ready to get up and get start, started moving myself. <laughs> There's lots more like that. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. We're gonna keep moving on with um, these presentations. So Jennifer, if you can mute, and then we'll bring up Maria McWhorter and the DC 1968 project. Thank you so much, Michonne. Uh, Rashid, if you can queue up the uh, PowerPoint, that would be great. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation and thank you uh, to Michonne, um, supported by Rashid for organizing it. I'm gonna spend my five minutes, um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna spend my five minutes talking about uh, the DC 1968 project, a new media project that I created that uses photographs and stories to reshape the collective memory of the year 1968 in Washington, DC. I invite you to check out the project at dc1968project.com on Instagram and also on Twitter. I launched the program, the project in 2018 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of 1968, which was such a momentous year locally, nationally, and internationally. And, um, and of course, many people have been comparing our current moment uh, with, uh, with 1968. And although there was nothing on the scale of COVID-19, there was a tremendous amount of activism and art organized around the struggle for black liberation understood broadly. I created the DC 1968 project because I wanted to counteract what Chimamandi Ngozi Adichie calls the danger of the single story. And the single story or one of the single stories uh, perpetrated by the white owned and white centered Washington Post newspaper and Washingtonian magazine, um, not yet uh, Rashid, um, was that black folks had destroyed the city after the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on 4 April 1968. Um, but these white media outlet, outlets acted as though there had not been rampant policies and practices of white supremacy in place in the city that were actually destroying the city, many of which continue today through state violence and hyperdevelopment. So I created the DC 1968 project to offer a fuller a more complex understanding and history of the city by posting 365 stories and photographs highlighting art, activism, architecture, and daily life in 1968. So as I said, um, I launched the project, um, uh, the project on January 1st, 2018, 
And every single day of that year, I posted a photograph, an original story about something that happened on that day in 1968. So in the time I have left, I'm gonna share with you three of the photographs and stories that resonate with our current moment. Okay, if you can um, cue up the next one, Rashid. The next slide. Great, thank you. So the first photograph and story features Elijah Bennett, who was 22 years old in October, 1968. Janice Bennett was his spouse and together they had four children and Ms. Bennett was pregnant with their fifth child. On the 8th of October, Mr. Bennett was murdered by a white police officer, David Roberts at 14th and U Streets Northwest. In response to the state-sponsored uh, murder, Howard University students and the New School of Afro-American Thought staged protests. And the Black United Front, which was co-founded by Stokely Carmichael in January of 1968, gave Mrs. Bennett $325 and encouraged others to also give her money and support. So this current practice of abolitionist work um, spearheaded by Black Lives Matter, Black Mamas Bailout, et cetera, in response to deep, uh, state violence has deep roots. On June 13th of this year, exactly three months after the police murder of Breonna Taylor and 19 days after the police murder of George Floyd, Erica Bennett emailed me with this subject line and I quote, Black Lives Matter. My father was killed by white cop, Elijah Bennett, end quote. So she was invoking me and pushing me through this story to say his name and also to say her name. You can cue up the next one, please, Rashid. The second photograph and story features the elections that took place on 5 November, 1968. On that day, Washingtonians voted in local and national elections. In fact, it was the first local election that Washingtonians had in, in the 20th century. Both the mayor and the city council were appointed by President Lyndon B. Johnson. The local election was for the new school board and there were 12 seats, but there, excuse me, there were 12 seats and um, 89 candidates uh, put, uh, were on the ticket for that. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and so this photograph, hopefully you can see it uh, well, shows one of the polling sites um, in Ward 1 in the city. And the poster on the left is the campaign poster uh, for Charles Cassell, who was an activist and um, architect here in Washington, DC. He was one of the 89 candidates. And the poster, which is actually it's a gorgeous color poster was created by artists Lou Stovall and Lloyd McNeil, who were both living in DC, uh, then Lou Stovall still does. And I love uh, Cassell's uh, image because he looks like he's doing a kind of side eye to Hubert Humphrey you can see there's a, a poster of Hubert Humphrey on the door of the, uh, of the polling site. And he looks like he's giving him a side eye. Uh, Hubert Humphrey, of course, was um, a white male who was a Democratic Party presidential candidate. Richard Nixon, obviously also a white male, was a Republican Party presidential candidate. And uh, a little known fact also is that Charlene Mitchell, a black woman, was a presidential candidate for the Communist Party. Okay, and cue up the next one, please. And so um, this is the final uh, photograph and story that I'm gonna share. And it features a crowd at Anacostia High School who were enjoying their homecoming game in 1968. And I really love this image for several reasons. First, so much of the visual palette that we have um, of 1968 is a black and white palette, but life was and is lived in color, right? And so, you know, it's important that we know um, and circulate images of uh, 1968 that were actually taken in color. Uh, and that also that those images are available in wider public circulation. Secondly, I love the, uh, the image because of the excitement, the exuberance, the joy and the movement that's evoked in the whir and blur um, of the image. And you see individuals who are wide mouth, you know what I mean? Just to me, just full of, just relaxed and full of freedom. Uh, and they were wide mouth because they're laughing, because they're shouting, because they're singing um, at their home, home school, excuse me, their homecoming game. I also love the outfit of the student in the lower right frame of the photograph. If you look closely, she has on a black and yellow outfit. Is it a pantsuit? Is it a skirt suit? 
and she's got these fabulous uh, mod glasses, seriously styling. Um, and then finally, the photograph speaks to the ability of high school students to be in a crowd together in 1968, something that unfortunately high school students in the US can't do today. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. We're gonna keep going. Um, we're gonna have some video next um, by Thomas Allen Harris. One is from his documentary, Through a Lens Darkly, fabulous documentary, Thomas. And then another clip from Family Pictures USA, but I'm going to turn everything over to you. Uh, thank you, Michonne, and also Rashid for, for this. And it's really great to be here with these wonderful um, other panelists, activists, uh, artists, um, thinkers. Um, yeah, so I just, I, um, I'm going to show a, a little clip from Through a Lens Darkly. Uh, it's a clip that is in the middle of the film. Through a Lens Darkly is a film that looks at um, the American family album through the eyes of African American photographers. So it's a kind of remix on American history through the lens, through a particular lens. And I uh, created this film together with Deborah, Dr. Deborah Willis, uh, who has been doing pioneering work around uncovering and documenting African-American photographic contributions. This section is actually in the middle of the film that actually talks uh, uh, about the, um, the movement uh, from North to South that has been, uh, uh, encompasses um, the great migration um, movement of African-Americans and their settlement in the North and in this particular uh, uh, section in Harlem and the role that photography helped them to play, help play in, um, in creating a kind of urban visual narrative for themselves. And it also inserts um, uh, uh, LGBTQ history, visual history, which um, in, in many ways has been left out of the narrative, the visual narrative of African-American life and also pro progress and movement. And so um, this short clip um, features various artists and um, it also has, there's a little bit of nudity in one of the art pieces. So um, I hope you enjoy this piece and I'll talk about it a little later. I came to Van der Zee through my grandparents' wedding portrait, prominently displayed in their home. It was a symbol of my grandfather's pride in our people, a testament to an enduring love, untainted by time. My first show was called The Good Life. It's basically about the notion of the nation using the UNIA flag, the Universal Improvement Association, as being the trope, the red, black, and green. And it was about notions of, let's say, the family of African heritage, but also unspoken issues around, like, say, pleasure and the body and sexuality. I come from, and we help to create a family in which those issues, you know, can be negotiated. Ironically, in all the images my grandfather had taken, there were no images of my grandmother's first cousin, whose name was also Thomas, but who went by Sugar. Sugar dressed in drag frequenting the clubs of Harlem's gay underground. My grandfather had to bail her out of jail on many occasions, until one day they found Sugar dead under mysterious circumstances. Why were there no images of Sugar? Yet there are photographs of my father's aunt, my great-aunt Eunice, who also lived her life out in the open though it was never spoken about or given a name.
I'm one of the lucky ones who's part of my family album. The family photo album is a place where the family represents itself to itself, but it doesn't represent certain things. Sexuality can be represented in certain kinds of ways and not other kinds of ways. These are self portraits that I made in my late teens and 20s. They embody for me such a moment of exploration and innocence. I think that they need to be seen. There's constantly this debate about whether it makes a difference who makes the picture. Yeah, it makes a difference who makes the picture. The work of black women photographers speaks to me in a way that no other work really can. Thomas, you need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. I just want to say um, how important it was for me to include this clip, being that uh, LGBT folks were so prominently um, uh, leading uh, certain um, uh, historically leading waves of um, of uh, uh, progress and uh, in terms of African American representation, and uh, it, whether it's in the Harlem Renaissance or uh, today in terms of Black Lives Matter movements, that that you know we have to um, really open ourselves up to think about an, um, the diversity of the representation uh, within African American life and culture. And then the second clip um, is from a series that came out of this uh, transmedia project I did as I was filming Through a Lens Darkly. And that was a project that really helped to people to activate their own family albums and to use them creatively in, um, in producing media, uh, making connections within uh, the, uh, connecting their own family photographic albums to larger social historical movements. And so this piece is a piece from the North Carolina episode um, of Family Pictures USA, and it features two families that come together, uh, African-American and uh, European-American families through a, a photograph and oral history, as well as some ancestry, uh, uh, ancestral work. Um, so uh, please run that clip. Uh, Rashid, thank you. The Walker side of our families go back to pre-Civil War. This is Buckley. Buckley is the patriarch. Buckley had two slave children that he gave to his in-laws because his wife did not want the children to live in the same household. And the slave children, Alice Walker Brooks married Mary Elizabeth Woods. They had 13 children. My grandfather was one of the children. This is a picture of his son, Alexander. I wore my tuxedo t-shirt today to remember my grandfather. And if it wasn't for this man who connected A and B and C and D and all the alphabet together, we would have never known that this woman who was my third grade teacher was actually my cousin. <laughs> that they tried to hide. <laughs> Take that, Buckley Walker. Right. You tried to separate us, but it didn't work. Right. Here, we, we are. here we are. Here we are. We figured it out. We found who was who, and here you know, you tried. Over a hundred years later. Over a hundred years here later. Here we are. Yep. Here we are. <laughs> all together. So I think it was James Baldwin that talked about the South as being uh, consisting of uh, ki uh, ki kissing cousins. Um, and so this, this series actually looks at America through the lens of the family album. We go to a particular place and we invite people to come in and share their family photographs. And out of that, we tell the story of a particular local uh, um, uh, city or uh, reg regional uh, area and um, to, for a larger audience. Uh, the series was broadcast in PBS. 
And, um, and so uh, that's uh, what I wanted to share a little bit about this kind of movement. Um, as Mishan mentioned earlier in, the, in um, her introduction, uh, the everyday in, in our lives. Thank you. Great. I, I hope you all don't hear the motorcade going by, but um, we're going to go to Mr. Edward White. And I've worked, I met Mr. White, and he's Mr. White when I'm working with him on the River City Drumbeat um, documentary by Ann Flatte and Marlon Johnson. And um, I think for tonight, can I call you Ed? You can, yes, yes. <laughs> You're that. Ed you know, tonight. <laughs> you know, Ed, you don't have to call me Mr. White. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're gonna just move right along and Rashid is going to cue the slides, the photographs you've taken. So you've been taking photographs in Louisville, Kentucky over the past couple of months, even during the COVID emergency. And just tell us um, what we're going to see in these photographs. So Rashid, can you cue those up? And Ed, just tell Rashid when to when to um, go uh, to the next slide. Okay. He can, yeah, all right. He can go on and, and, and cue in the first slide. Okay, now this is uh, I guess what got me started in this is in 1968 when 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 the the nation was doing what it was doing, my family was a very constrict and and conservative about going along to get along. So we were on lockdown. We were not allowed to, to uh, get out. And I was pretty young and my oldest brother would always sneak out. And my job was to let him in at night when he, you know, once they thought everyone was in the house, he would sneak out and then I would let him in. And so I missed all of it. And then as this Brianna Taylor just unfolded, you know, I remember it as, uh, it was just a back article in the newspaper, a back article, you know, and it was just, and I looked at it and I, I thought it was strange. And then all of a sudden it just started getting traction. And once it started getting traction and, and uh, we came down into, people started gathering in the heart of downtown in Jefferson Square. And so this photograph was, uh, it's been a hundred and over a hundred days of, uh, protests. And so I said, you know, I'm retired. Let me get my camera and get out. And so I just got out and started going to the protest and, and listening and, and seeing the, the energy, the energy that were people were going on. And so this is a lady who was, uh, her name's Miss Earlene. She was a, uh, uh, a pipe fitter. And she was talking about all of the the racism that she had to go through in being a female pipe fitter, which is a skilled trade, which is very, you know, very uh, highly segregated. And, and so that was her time to be on the mic. And I just, you know, I just captured that moment. I said, look at this. And so that's, that's what that is. And so you can go to the next slide. Uh, this was the day of the celebration of Brianna Taylor's birthday. And it was a very, very huge, and it was right on the, the courthouse steps of, in downtown Louisville. And I feel that when you take photographs, you really capture the person's spirit. And as I've gone different places, and especially when I went to Africa, they didn't like to have their photographs taken. You know, and so when I, it's like we look, we look right at each other. And I could feel her eyes and she could feel my eyes. And, and you know, I, I just snapped that moment in time. That's one of my favorite because that's in my brain right now, that particular day, that image. And I was taking other photographs and she was in a group. And then all of a sudden our eyes just locked on each other. And I shot that. And I'm really, I think that's one of, that's one of my favorites as I've started back into uh, photography. You can go to the next one. 
same day. This was uh, on the courthouse steps. Uh, it was a very, very large group. And it was probably 50-50 uh, mix of, of cultures. And I saw so many of those signs. And that sign is, is true today as it was yesterday and it always will be when you see injustice and if you are a part of the dominant society and you see it, then your silence is just as the violence is what's been done. And I, and I, I saw that and I just could not pass that particular photograph up. It, it you know, my, my belief is as, as I was studying photography, uh, my instructor always says a photograph must speak for itself. You can't explain it. So that photograph right there speaks for itself. And that is so true. You can go to the next. Now this one was a night that, that things just kind of exploded. Uh, a guy, uh, this is the Hall of Justice downtown. He uh, went up on the side of the building and threw uh, a flammable liquid on, on the cardboard and set it on fire. And about this time, uh, the, all of the sheriffs came out to put the fire out. And if you see, it's a guy, it's one of the sheriffs is on the ground. When he came out, they just start pelting them with, with water bottles, with full water bottles. And, and when he came out, that water bottle hit him. And it was just like he got hit with a Joe Frazier hook. He went straight down. And I'm standing there watching this, trying to shoot it. And then I remember the, the night before a guy on uh, one of the news stations was in the same situation, looking through his camera and they pepper sprayed him. And I just got, you know, that just went through my, my mind and it was like, wow. And they, uh, I mean, they just rained water bottles on them. They, they picked him up. Uh, put the fire out and went back in in the building. And I expected, you know, more police and the, all the police come out, but they just just went on back in and 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 that is that image. It was uh, it was a very surreal moment at that particular time because you could just feel the, you know, you could feel the anger that they had, but it was so many bottles of water raining down on them. They, and they said, well, we just, best thing for us to do is pick him up, put this fire out and get back in the building. And they never came out again. So uh, that was during the curfew. Uh, you can uh, go to the next side. This young guy right here, I've got several images of him in different events. And I mean, again, the, the image speaks for itself, you know, say her name and you know, when you, when you think about that story, you know, the, the facts of this story are so distorted and so incompetent. You know, it was just like uh, Barney Fife and, and Andy and, and, and the whole Mayberry was the police that, that led to the chain of events that caused this young lady to lose her life. And ironically is, uh, when they broke into the apartment, uh, one, one shot was fired and they fired 32 shots and not a one of him hit, hit Walker and, and six of them, they hit Brianna with six shots. And then the guy that they are, uh, that they indicted, he was on the outside of the building. He didn't know what he was shooting at. He couldn't see anything. He just started, he fired 10 rounds into the building. So, uh, uh, I mean, that, that, that shot speaks for itself. It really does. So to me, that's, that's another one of my favorite shots. And it's just a story that really, I said, I have to go down here and document this. And so that, you know, we can have some history of what the people did do around this that can now support the uh, 
uh, the, the newspapers. So, you know, I've been collecting the newspapers and I'm going to put on another exhibit of the photographs also with your articles. So we're, we'll be able to tell the story. The story will be able to be told photographically and through the newspapers uh, so that people can really have, be able to see the facts. Because the facts is, is that the whole, this whole scenario was done, was a comedy of errors that caused a very, very, very wonderful young lady to lose her life. You know, uh, her mother would never have any grandchildren. Uh, uh, Walker never will, will get married. And, you know, and, and yeah, I, I just feel for him. His life is never gonna be the same, never never ever going to be the same you know and and he more than likely he's going to have ptsd of that night you know he fires one shot and they and they fire fire 32 and you know and he walks out with a strike you know what i mean without a scratch and brianna is 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 gone i mean and 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 as you mentioned the the 68 and and to hear that story there are so many of them stories and I tell people right now, the police are the last people, last people I'm gonna call. It's gotta be a dare, I mean, it, it has to be a very dare situation for me to call the police because in the event of me calling the police to, I guess, intercede, there's a 50-50 chance that somebody's gonna die. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna yield my time back to the, uh, back to Michonne. Thank you, thank you, Ed. So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to bring you all together and just wanted to, rather than I ask the questions, see if you have questions to ask each other about what you've just seen and heard from each other. And if you go silent, then I have some questions I'll ask you and also ask the audience to um, type any questions into the chat and we'll pull from there. So, you know, if we were sitting in my living room or someplace or, or having coffee, you know, we, we would just have a conversation. So who wants to start? Anyone has have any ideas or thoughts? I would, I would like to start is, as I see the stories that y'all have developed now is, is, is giving me a leg to now know that what I'm doing in the path I wanna go is there, is valid. And so I'm just trying, that's, that's, that's more of a comment than, than a question. So just how, how do I start, you know, documenting this thing, creating this story? Okay. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, I'll ask a question of the panel. Oh, so um, we're talking about digital platforms. Um, what were the challenges, what are the challenges you find with the digital technology and what are the joys? And, and for you, Ed, I know that um, when we were, I'll say we, yes. picked up our first cameras, we had um, film. Yeah. And went into dark rooms. You too, um, Thomas, we know what that's, that's about. I remember yeah. sitting in closet and, with my little can and, and reel. And the so smell. Yeah, and the smell. So we no, um, no. now we have digital cameras. So what are the challenges in, in the work that you've done with digital technology and some of the joys? Jennifer, you want to go first? Uh, you have to unmute. I think that there are the, the joys in many ways are the ease of doing digital work. I mean, so often one can work even from a cell phone or a laptop or in any place, you don't have to be physically in an office or in a particular location. And so it means that it was wonderful, for example, to be able to go to Lowndes County, Alabama with uh, just a couple of other people and to record interviews with people who are now in their 70s and 80s. So that's the precious thing of being able to get out and get about without having to raise a ton of money. And so that's a positive thing. The One of the 
challenges. It's not a negative to me, but it's a challenge of all technology, just that technology changes. And so it becomes really important to make sure that the work is connected to an institution or some place that will be able to preserve it for the future. Because, uh, you know, if we had been doing this a number of years ago, we would have been talking about, oh, 8-track and VHS or beta. <laughs> And so those are technologies that are gone. So there will be other technologies in the future. And I just hope that all of this precious work, I mean, everybody's work that we've seen tonight is so wonderful. And I just hope that it will then end up being in places where we can see it for decades and decades to come. Yeah, I, I, could, I could build off on that. And thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I think that yeah, yeah, particularly at this time when we have, um, uh, you know, p kids being, um, you know, quarantined and, and not being able to have access to classrooms, thinking about this digital technology and, you know, salons like this to like really spread the word and see, you know, these, this, these kinds of great um, initiatives like Maria's or Jennifer's, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, I feel like I want to go on there and, uh, and learn, you know, and I know I'm steep in, in history. So, um, so I think that, that it's, it's the accessibility is the kind of one of the joys and pleasures. And I think the other, um, the challenge also is for me is how to uh, get the word out in a much larger kind of way. And so I really applaud you for this, uh, this, this um, uh, salon. And I hope that people who are seeing it will also blog about it or share, you know, this, that wonderful SNCC website or the uh, Maria's uh, 68 uh, Instagram or Ed White's, you know, photographs, because it's, you know, we need to see these things and, and to cut through all of the, you know, the distracted distractions in media presently. And, and I'll share as well that, that definitely one of the joys um, of this, of, of using social media, using new media, using digital technologies is, is that I was able to connect to a lot of people who had memories of 1968 actually by using, you know, these, these new media uh, technologies. I, I got on Facebook and I was just like, hey, I'm doing this project, who has memories? And so people were just able to, you know, to share their stories, their memories, their photographs, their artifacts, you know, et cetera. And, and that I was able to connect with someone and then that person was able to connect with somebody else. And so it helped to provide this kind of um, network that may have been, you know, more time consuming or maybe impossible, um, you know, other ways, otherwise. And I think the, I think the challenges um, uh, of it, um, I think, I mean, there are multiple challenges, but I think maybe speaking to um, Erica Bennett, you know, who reached out to me, it actually turned out not to be a challenge. But when I was doing the project, I hadn't thought about the fact um, that I might put up um, a photograph, an image, or tell a story that might be triggering or traumatic, you know, for someone. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. And so I think one of the things is that there is this kind of impulse to just share, to just put out, um, but I, but I also think they're also, it's also taught me that all, you know, that there, that um, the intent that you have may come off differently for someone, and that yeah, again, it can be triggering and traumatic, and it's important to be thoughtful and to proceed with a kind of love and care when you're doing this work, because you may have again a, a particular intention, but these are other people's lives, you know what I mean. These are other people's stories and are other people's memories. And so we also have to be careful about what that means when you put it out digitally and it can potentially go out, go out to the world. I, I wanna, wanna explore that, especially with Jennifer and Thomas, because you, you've worked in media, television, and I know this is a conversation that's been happening with documentary makers and independent filmmakers about the responsibility um, angle of all this, you know, um, how would you, what are your thoughts about responsibility and what content that we're presenting, but at the same time, how, how sensitive um, are we being to, or are we thinking about the audience at the same time? Or maybe that, that's not a, 
very helpful to getting the important work out there and, and telling the story. Well, I, th I think it's all of the above. I think uh, one has to think about and be sensitive to who is the audience and what's the purpose of the work. But I also think that it is so absolutely essential to do what it and what Thomas are doing in documenting and, and finding these images and what Maria is doing in that respect. I think it's so important to collect this material to gather the materials and that yes, there are some cases where given the uh, nature for, of the material, I mean, we lost a lot of people. There were a lot of people who were killed during the civil rights movement, a lot of people. And the, they were tortured, their bodies were mutilated. And so I think one has to be sensitive about what you're showing and where you're showing it to. It's not necessarily appropriate to show it in a third grade classroom, for example. However, I think these are stories that those kids in that third grade classroom will need to hear in the future and will need to know. Uh, so I, I think there is a balance that one strikes about this. Yeah, I, I would add that, um, I, and I agree with, with Jennifer, Jennifer's uh, assessment. Um, I would add that I've always been invested in uh, what I call community storytelling. And that is working, not seeing someone exclusively as a subject, but as a participant in the creation of a story. So, and that has been uh, essential, an essential aspect of, of my work that led me to Family Pictures USA. And so, um, you know, I, I think that what's, what's great about this kind of digital space is that, you know, we can try things and we're, you know, we're, we, you know, we can also fail and, but people can talk to us. You know, I've had people tell me, well, I'd rather this not be on online, you know, and it's, it's like, oh, well, I'm sorry, but I'll take it off. And that's, you know, that's something that is possible to do. I mean, if you had like, you know, a big budget film and it's done and someone <laughs> says that after it's like on PBS or whatever, it's like, I'm sorry, it's too late. But, you know, in this new kind of storytelling and, um, you know, modality of the digital, in the digital space, it's, it's a little bit more, it's looser. It's, it's, it's also, it, the, the collaboration extends, you know, into the distribution. And so I love that aspect of it. And uh, I, I, teach my students that as well. And you know, I have a, a archive. This, this is a, a, a moment of the archive, you know, where we have so much material. And thank goodness we don't just have to either let it go to trash or to accumulate in a basement that we can actually do something creative with it, you know? And so I, I'm totally committed to this. And, I, you know, and I, I think it's really important that we value those things. It's our, our, our stories are our gold. Yeah, and I, 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 oh, I just wanted to say really quickly that I think that's a great point about um, that Thomas just shared that one of the beautiful things about about being in the digital space is that it is it's not closed. It's generative. It's iterative. You know what I mean? That people can reach out uh, and engage with it, comment on it, fix it, change it, correct it. And so I think, you know, unlike, say, a book or a film or something that's already done and already closed, yeah, a lot of these digital projects, their spaces, yeah, in which they can be generative and iterative. Um, Ed, you're going to have an exhibit at the Kentucky School of Art and Design. How is yes. that being organized? What, what, what's the theme of that exhibit featuring your photographs? And well, it's theme, going to be virtual too. Yes, I've, in fact, it already is. And I will be able to send you the, uh, I will be able to send it to you. Uh, basically, it was they found found out that I was documenting uh, the the Bianca Taylor event, but also that I was a uh, that I was a past in my past photography was in my background, and so what I did is I just was able to to do the Bianca event, but also submit some of my uh, photographs from the angry viking you know so on derby day we had the the nfac from atlanta here so then with so that's that's black men with guns 
And then we had uh, the angry Viking at, on the other side of town. And that was white men with guns. So, you know, I, I never saw so many men with automatic, automatic weapons and bullets and knives and guns. And it was just amazing that no one, you know, that nobody died that day on either side. And so from there, uh, uh, the exhibit started around that, but also I told them I wanted to, to put in some of my, uh, some of my other stuff. So uh, I sent them like 40, 46 images and they chose 22 and it was, it kind of ran the gamut. I was, I was really excited. And then it kind of let me understand the power of photography, especially when you can, can use it to let the image, let the image tell the story, the image speaks for itself. So therefore I was able to do that. And now after this, hearing these conversations tonight, it really lets me know how easy, I'm, I'm gonna say easy compared from coming from a film with a camera with 36, with either 24. 24, 36. <laughs> 24, 36. <laughs> that, that's so limited, you know, and so, and then of that limit, then you had to go process them. And then you had to make a, a proof. So there were so many steps. And now with the digital, with a digital camera, I can shoot hundreds, you know, <laughs> I can shoot hundreds in a day, but the bad thing about that is then you got to set an editor. You know, so with 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 film, I got 34 shots and I'm going to be very, very selective. I mean, I'm going to be very, very selective of those 36 shots, how many I'm going to shoot. So now, so with the digital, it, it, it gives you an, an overabundance. And then for some photographers, you lose, for me, it's just me speaking, you lose your quality because then you just start randomly shooting because you can. And so it's kind of made me kind of stick to the old school is shoot, the, you know, it's always, you know, you shoot, the, you capture the, you capture the photo in the lens, not in the dark room. So, uh, uh, so that's been, been my challenge. And, and after speaking with you all tonight, it's, it's, Y'all got my head spinning. It's that's spinning. What, good. That's what I wanted. <laughs> that was the it, goal of this. Spinning I, because I got this one project that I'm let you. I got this project. I was I lived in. Uh, my grandmother was a school teacher, and she taught uh, before uh, Brown versus Board. And in the state of Kentucky, once if once you became married, you could no longer be a teacher. They didn't let married women teach. And so, you know, we lived in this community and this, you know, was 99.9%, uh, you know, white Irish that was very, very racist, but we had this, this community within this community. And our church was created by a man who decided that he would sell himself back into slavery to get some money so that he could build a church. So now I am, you know, doing all of that research to get them photos together so I can tell the story as you know y'all have really pushed me pushed me forward now so it's been a good night. Thomas have you ever done a family pictures USA Kentucky? No I'd love to I'd okay, love to. Okay you two and, need yeah. to talk. <laughs> yeah definitely I yeah, think we... great and I just want to say how wonderful I, I had a chance to see um, a, a, a wider array of your photographs uh, uh, Mr. Ed White and I just really appreciated them and um, and uh, it was great to see you know these um, just the, the uh, I don't know it just it struck me as um, uh, it just it was just very powerful to see you know these images of uh, from from this you know potentially extremely volatile situation you know and to have a sense of what was going on, you know, because uh, there were things that were happening all over the country. And, and um, you know, it's a, it's a huge movement. 
and to just see these different aspects of it through that lens, you know, particularly in Louisville. So I, I really appreciate it, you know, looking through them and I look forward to seeing more. Well, I'm going to do it. And then, and then I, I just want to piggyback in that day, Thomas, when I was out at Cox Park with the angry Viking, it was, I was kind of scary when I first got there, you know, there were a handful of, of, there were a handful of us that were there and I was the only one uh, in that handful that was not in that mindset. I was and wondering you, about, about those images and how you felt taking those pictures. <laughs> oh, it's scary. <laughs> Look at guys with those big guns. <laughs> yeah, we didn't bring a, those pictures in, but they were men with guns. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, real guns, real guns. Yeah. You know, and, it, and as you talk, and I talked to them, they, they were from Mississippi, they were from Georgia, they were from, I mean, they were from everywhere. And, and then when this this angry uh, the angry Viking actually showed up, he showed up with an entourage, and they were you know he was in the middle of this entourage, and all these guys got these guns, and then one of them said uh, you know we kind of the more I stayed there and the more they saw me, the more they forgot who I was you know why I was you know who I was, and the guy said, would you like to hold one? I said, not really, but I would. But I said first of all. If you do it, you got to unload it. So these guns are uh, hold 30, 30 rounds. They got 30 rounds in the gun. And then each one of them have another four to five clips with 30 clips in the gun. And then they got nine millimeter Glocks and they hold 17 shots. And then each one of them got four clips of that. I said, man, man. And then this guy showed up, this guy showed up with a sign and said, we don't want y'all, we do not want your guns in, in Louisville. And they mobbed him. I said, oh my God, what's gonna happen here? And then uh, one of the guys within the Angry Vikings entourage said, no, y'all need to let him alone because this is first amendment rights and we cannot, trample on his rights when we are trying to to uh, 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 display our rights. It was like, that's the moment I got scared. But you you're know, here, so. to, here to tell the story. And yes. unfortunately, that one hour went very fast. Yes. <laughs> and it, and um, these stories were very good and these platforms are just amazing. I, I applaud yeah. all of your work. I love all of your work. And um, for all of those of you who are watching us, I have two more polls. I want you to stick around to take the poll. Let's see. Can I, can I make a statement? Are you doing the poll? Yes, you can. Yeah, I just want to say that there's an Atlanta-based uh, photographer, Sue Ross, who is a wonderful uh, civil rights photographer. Go check out her work. She's been very supportive of our Family Pictures USA project. And, and, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I, just, I saw Sue Ross there. I wanna say hi, Sue. <laughs> okay, so hi, Sue, you're there. And um, I wanna say hi to all my friends who are here and all of your friends who are here. So I just put a poll up about digital social media programs. What is your top your primary digital tool to share your information and ideas. And um, that poll is happening now because you, you can stretch yourself a little in too many places. Would you all agree, our panelists? Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I definitely, for, for me, uh, for that whole year in, in 2018, I posted I first posted on my website and then I posted on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But what I did was because each of those different social media pl platforms have their own kind of culture, I actually tailored the posts to those particular platforms. And so it, it got real deep, it got real time consuming, and I was really exhausted by the end of the, <laughs> end of the day and end of the year. And so, uh, I mean, that was a choice that I made, but, um, but yeah, you can, it, it can be pretty, uh, pretty deep and heavy depending upon the tools. Mm -hmm. 
But you're absolutely right, Maria. You um, do have to tailor the message for the different platforms. There's the Instagram group, there's the Facebook group, there's the Twitter group. And each of those messages has to be adjusted. You know, same, you could use the same picture, but it will have a different message and tone depending on what you're using. Okay, so exactly. I would also mention that uh, in addition, there's another group and that they are incredibly important to us with the SNCC Digital Gateway and that's educators. Mm -hmm. that our materials, our website is visited uh, regularly by school teachers, students, and university and college professors as well, and for people from all over the globe. But a lot of people do come there for materials for the classroom. And I think that the work that everybody on this panel is doing is really important for that kind of education as well. Absolutely. So I have one more poll and that's about impact of tonight's event. What are you gonna do after you get off the Zoom? And um, you know, that poll is up right now. Um, I will send the speakers' websites to you from Eventbrite so that everyone who joined us tonight will have that information and check things out. Um, also, if you want to Join us for another event. Um, I'll put a link up for you to sign up to receive an announcement. Also, I'll put a link up so that you can connect with these projects as well, because everybody here, I assume, has a mailing list, correct? Correct. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. And they would love to answer your questions. So um, right now we have the other, that poll up, and um, I want to thank all of you, thank you so much, Jennifer, Thomas, Ed, Maria, and Rashid, who you don't see, but we can we hear you to say hello? He's muted. He's muted. I'm still here. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, be safe, be kind, be hopeful, and have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to be here with everyone. <laughs> Rashad, I'm, we're going to get together on that Family Pictures USA. Well, okay. That's Thomas. 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 Yeah. Thomas. <laughs> get together on that Family USA Kentucky because I've watched your stuff on, on PBS. Oh, thank you so much. Ed. Oh, now the for some reason the Q&A just got lively. Can we just take one question before we go? Okay. Yep. Um, let's see, it's something that we haven't already answered. How do you see the relevance of your documentary work for a global audience? That sounds like you, Thomas. Um, well, I, I think that, um, I mean, I could just say that um, with, with this last, uh, up, the last uprising um, and uh, around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we just saw the, the, um, the echoing of it, uh, both in terms of the, um, you know, the, the crimes that were committed against pe you know, people of color in Europe, in South America, um, and people rising up as a result of that. So I think that seeing these images gives people a sense of hope and uh, a sense of connectedness across uh, borders. Uh, my own work, because I grew up partly in East Africa and my parents are part of uh, various movements, including the anti-apartheid movement, I've always, been, I've always tailored my work for uh, both a national and a global, global audience. And I think I, I, I kind of share that with Jennifer Lawson, certainly, because, you know, because we, there's some overlap. We were both in Tanzania at, at you know, different times, but, um, but you know, the, this, that, that, that movement work you know, that, that's connected, uh, it's always been connected you know, between, you know, across the diaspora. And it's incredible the range of interest that people have globally in what we're doing here in the movement and in the movement history. Uh, we were asked by a, uh, an Italian university in Bologna to uh, write an article that has been published um, about the work that we were doing and how we came about doing the SNCC digital project. And they were most interested in the fact that we wanted real, we didn't want stories by historians, 
but we wanted people to be the owners of their own history. The kind of work that Maria is doing and that Thomas is doing shows that there is a real strength to having the honesty of people's views. So it's from the inside out rather than having people with expertise looking down into a community. Okay, so on that note, I will say good night. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Have a good rest of the week. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Be safe. Yes. <laughs>